guys, I'm going to keep this intro short since this is already a long video. Uh, if you click this video, you're interested in the process of restoring a Superjet. Um, I'm going to be covering uh, all the differences in the Superjets, how to restore the whole, uh, how to get all the components in there, where they hook up to, uh, pretty much everything you can think of, um, and cram it into one video. Uh, this is the first YouTube video I've made, uh, so please comment if I've missed anything or if you want to see more of anything. Uh, I do plan on restoring a X2 in my next video, uh, so let me know more of what you'd like to see. Um, but like I said, this is a long video, so I'm just going to jump right into it. I've got a square nose and a round nose kind of out, and uh, I think a lot of people are kind of confused on what they should get, either a square nose or a round nose. There's actually a huge price difference between the two. Usually you can get a square nose for 1700 bucks, uh, round noses. Usually start out at a minimum of four thousand, so uh, pretty big price difference. So let me actually kind of show you uh, what benefits you'd actually get, uh, if any. Kind of spoiler alert, but um, all right, let me get right into it. All right, so this is the square nose. I've already finished uh, repairing it and sanding it, so it's just ready for paint. Um, the right side, I've got a round nose. Uh, as you can see, it's beat up pretty bad and I'm still repairing it. But what is the difference between the two? As you can see, there is no difference. So in terms of performance, um, how it handles on the water, you're going to get equal for what you know money you put into it. So, and that goes for everything. This part here, it's identical. Uh, all the hookups are identical. Um, bolt holes are identical. And even the fronts are identical. Same shape. Uh, there is one difference. And that is the exhaust. So, this I've already replaced. This is now in a two and a half inch, uh, whereas the stock is below two inch. I forgot the number exactly, but the, that is one difference between the round nose stock and the square nose. So you can get these from um, uh, this one I got from Rad Dudes, um, and yeah, that'll pretty much make it. It's the same as a Superjet. So let's flip her on the other side and see what's the differences on, on that. This is the square nose. The most obvious difference between a round nose and the square nose is going to be this section here. Um, the round nose uh, turf shapes just a little bit differently. This is the main part that's different. So on the round nose, it kind of veers off and there's less turf room. So you get more of your paint job shown here. That's what it looks like. Whereas this one is a lot more straightforward. Um, a, that makes kind of turfing it a lot easier. <clears throat> B, there's only aesthetic differences between the two. In terms of what looks better, Honestly, not much difference. In terms of the tray room, you're going to be getting identical tray room between the two. This is actually cut out foam, so um, once it's all put back together, it's going to be identical to the square nose. <coughs> uh, as far as the dash panel goes, so I'm going to pause the video here and add something. So there is a uh, something I missed uh, in the video. Uh, there's that bottom one one inch by one inch uh, square that we're seeing at the very bottom that does uh, uh, limit the amount of, of tray room that you have on the square nose. Uh, and the round nose does not have that. They eliminated that on the round nose, which is a, a pretty big benefit of, uh, uh, of the round nose is getting that extra little bit of, of tray room and you don't stub your toes on it. Uh, alternatively, on the square nose, which I've done on all mine, you can add a 22 millimeter uh, layer of padding 
that just lines up right to that uh, square that we're seeing. And uh, so it just kind of blends right in um, so you don't stub your toes. The round nose does come with a plastic covering that you can put on top of this. Uh, so that is one difference from the round nose to the square nose. Most people go over it with turf anyways, but that is a benefit of the round nose as it comes with a plastic cover that you can take on and off. Um, the hood latches are all the same. <clears throat> the catches are a little bit different that goes on the hood. So what about the inside? I'm just going to go ahead and mute myself here. Um, so the insides are identical. Um, everything that you're seeing here is is the same. They super Yamaha did make some uh, improvements over the years of filling all the holes better. Uh, like for instance, this model uh, of round nose compared to the one on the left, they did a better job of putting kind of a, a, a goop or a, an epoxy over all the holes on the round nose. Uh, so if you do have a square nose, when you do cut into the hole like this, you'll want to be putting epoxy over all the holes. But other than that, the inside of the round nose is identical. Um, so I'm going to bring you to the inside now. I'm going to keep myself muted on this as well. Uh, so the inside of the round nose and the inside of the um, square nose are completely the same. I am po kind of pointing out that the corners of the uh, the top there are kind of rounded on the round nose and the square nose they're kind of squared off. Uh, the bottom tray is going to be the uh, exact same since they're obviously the same on the very bottom of the ski. They're going to be the same in the engine bay. Um, there is little to no differences uh, in the round nose engine bay compared to the uh, square nose um, so that is that. All right, so for the biggest difference, that's going to be the front. So the engine mount is angled on the square nose, whereas it is a very flat on the round nose. So the pole is going to sit a little differently between the two. Um, the round nose does sit slightly higher. That would be the only performance benefit that I can see between the two. Um, because the handle pole sits up higher, you're going to be a little bit more uh, tippier uh, with your controls. Um, with your handling, I should say, uh, between the two jet skis. This one sits a little bit lower. Um, so it takes a little bit more effort to turn the ski um, with your weight. So uh, that could be argued it would be the only difference between the two jet skis besides having the bigger external exhaust. Um, other than that, the other big difference is the square nose does require a large hood. Um, panel that a lot of people break and lose or you know that they're hard to get as well whereas the round nose does have something similar it does still have a, a, a piece that goes here but it locks into place a lot a lot better uh, a lot people a lot less people break these um, notab notably better in that regard so um, which one do you get um, I can't really tell you which one to get. You're paying double for this. Um, for the few differences being the front and the rear exhaust being bigger uh, for notable performance differences. So it's up to you. All right, so this is the hole that I bought. I bought it without an engine. Um, hole was in uh, decent condition. Uh, there's definitely a lot of things that I'm going to uh, repair, uh, such as the hole that used to have a kind of a frontal exhaust. Uh, there's also some patchwork that I'm just going to completely get rid of and start uh, start fresh. Um, uh, but anyways, let's get right into it. So the first thing that you're going to be doing is uh, kind of taking a, a sander 
um, and going over this flat surface, um, so you're not going to want to go too deep. Uh, and I'll kind of uh, show what you're going to be doing for these deeper scratches here. Uh, but yeah, you're just going to be taking a uh, sander like this, uh, get some uh, 120 grit uh, sandpaper, and you're just going to be doing uh, up and down motions across the whole middle here. Uh, it's important that you uh, do not use a sander on the start of these um, uh, chine, chine lines here. Uh, so don't uh, don't go on the corners in here. You want to keep the stock shape as uh, as close to stock as possible. If, if you take some heavy grit sandpaper and go at an angle, you're going to be flattening these corners. And the more dips you have, you're going to kind of create waves as you go across the water and that's going to either A, cause your ski to go left and right or it's going to be, you know, bumpy. So uh, only use a sander on this flat spot here. I would use it all up here and then stop right where these, the, these bumps start here. Um, so for this area, you're going to be uh, basically taking a sandpaper and putting it on the flat of this uh, your wrist here um, and just kind of going like this. Going up and down and using the contour of your wrist to kind of shape to shape those. So here's me going over this area with the sander. Um, my goal here is to not get rid of all the scratches. I'm just basically shaving off uh, a few centimeters from the flat surface on the, the very bottom. I'm going to be avoiding all the corners at all costs, so you're not going to see me kind of rounding off the corners. It's just simply working on the flat spot. Um, and then the next step will be filling in all those scratches. All right, so now you're going to take this off and you're just going to kind of cup it like this and you're going to go up and down So this flat part here, you can then use the flat part of your hand and kind of brace, brace your thumb on the flat part up here so you can get nice flat straight lines. You can tell that whatever was on this is just a cheap rattle can paint. It's just coming right off and there's several layers. There's a white, which was stock I'd assume, and there's a yellow and then there's a black. So you want to get down to the white as much as possible. Uh, if you see gashes or gouges, uh, just ignore them for now. Once again, I'll kind of show you what the next stage is. Uh, once it gets kind of gunked up like this, you want to kind of smack this on the edge of something to get rid of this buildup here and it makes sanding a lot easier like that. So, and just keep going. important step. Uh, a lot of jet skis will have decals on them. Uh, you are uh, not going to sand them down because um, what's going to happen is if you start sanding this off, this part is going to sand off pretty easily, whereas this one will take actually quite a while to get rid of this plastic layer. And then once you do get past the plastic layer, 
this is going to be lower than the stock uh, paint, so you're going to have to sand this area even more and trying to avoid this area, and then you're going to have like all this waviness on uh, your paint jobs. So what you want to do is get a heat gun, and it literally only takes uh, a few seconds of heat, and you'll pe it'll peel right off. So I'll show you show you how, how that works. So this sticker right here, very brittle if you try to pick it off, just comes right off in like very small sections, it would take forever to do it. Heat gun, I'd say about 10-15 seconds of just a half an inch away. Should just peel right off. A lot better than sanding it because now you're working with a flat surface um, just a lot better than than sanding all right uh, so I just got done doing the middle lines and the top and all the corners uh, I did do the side as well and um, so this is where the decals were and uh, let me step back a bit you can kind of see no decals, and this is where decals were. Um, even though I took the time and used the heat gun to take the decals off, there's still a little bit of uh, residue, uh, and kind of sanding over that, it created highs and lows. Uh, even though I was uh, sanding in a, in a uh, straight pattern, it, it created highs and lows. So uh, you want to try to get all the uh, residue off, like all the goo. Uh, maybe use like a, a goo be gone, uh, anything chemically to kind of wipe it off um, and then do the sanding. So I'm going to have to kind of touch up a bit here with the, the sander. Uh, another thing is this guy had some type of um, aftermarket exhaust, so there's kind of an imprint. Um, once again, I'm going to show you how to fill in all these little cracks and uh, stuff like this uh, to where you won't even see it. Um, so anyways, stay tuned. So I'm almost done with one side. Um, as you can see, there's quite a bit of work to do to get it to line up with the stock hole. So, uh, but it's definitely come a long ways from what it used to look like. Once again, this is uh, what it looks like if you don't do a um, fiberglass repair job correctly. Um, or I guess uh, this works, but it, if you care about it a little bit more as far as the way it looks and the way it performs. Uh, this is just putting glass over the stock uh, the stock hole rather than grinding out or lowering it and then adding glass. Um, so compared to the stock, it then just raises over and it, it just looks bad. So, um, yep. Okay, so with uh, continuing the uh, hole repair, um, after you get done sanding it uh, completely, uh, the next step you're going to be working on is uh, fixing the fiberglass. So you're going to be looking for um, big gashes, uh, brittle fiberglass, or damaged areas. Uh, we're actually going to be doing fiberglass repairs. Um, uh, and later on we're going to be doing uh, fillers for all the small cracks and crevices. Um, but for uh, fiberglass repair, uh, what you're going to want to do is um, kind of grind out the uh, damaged area with a grinder um, and then you're going to be uh, getting the area cleaned off and then putting fiberglass down, letting it cure, and then um, sanding it some more and flattening it out and then adding fillers to the entire hole. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the flow of it, which I'll get into. So I'm going to patch this hole, and uh, you can use this technique for any repair. Um, but basically what I'm going to do is... Um, so if you were to just put fiberglass in the center here, and let it dry, 
you could easily just push on it and it'll pop through because it's not backed by anything. Um, the problem with putting backing on the front is you uh, raise and will cause a, a high level if you're trying to make it flat with the rest of the side of the jet ski. Same with the bottom. If you if you just put glass over something, it's going to create a little mound where the uh, glass goes. So to avoid that, uh, what I'm doing is putting some uh, tape behind here just so I it won't leak at all. And I'm going to feather out uh, about a half an inch to an inch. I'm going to feather out an angle uh, with a grinder. So I'm just going to kind of take that and, and grind out an angle so there's an incline going into the uh, engine bay basically. So there's an incline all the way around and what I'm going to do is put a layer in the exact center just to give it a nice structural layer. Then the second, third, and fourth layer I'm going to put one on the incline on the all the way outside and on the inside and, and keep filling this area so that the incline goes away and what that uh, the end effect is if you push on it the fiberglass has something to push against uh, so it's not going to punch through uh, if you're really concerned about it which I'm also going to do once this dries I'm gonna put a backing layer on the inside since nobody really sees the inside of the engine bay uh, putting one one or two more layers of fiberglass on the back that extends an inch around the back around the whole circle is probably a good idea but if you're just trying to fill a big gash you're just gonna take this grinder feather out uh, feather out uh, about a finger's length width on each side of the crack and then you're going to fill it with glass and once again you can back the back side if you want and then you're going to sand it smooth um, and that's pretty much it that's how you do all the repairs uh, you want to grind out any brittle uh, weak or cracks um, across the whole hole and um, using the feathering technique and just make sure there's backing to whatever you do, whatever you repair. All right, uh, let's go over supplies. So um, for fiberglass repair, you're going to need some cups for mixing, mixing sticks, uh, application brush. I would get like a, a whole bag of these. They're about I don't know, 40 cents each, just grab a ton of these. Um, you're going to need Cabasil. So Cabasil is basically like you can't even feel it. It's just very fine powder. And what it does is it uh, thickens up your epoxy. So this is the epoxy that I buy. Uh, you can get all these products on US Composites website. Uh, they make different... Uh, hardeners, they make medium, uh, slow, and fast hardener. Just depends on what temperature you're going to be working with and how fast you want it to uh, harden. Um, next on the list, um, this is going to be a putty. Basically, you just kind of smear this into pinholes. Um, doesn't need any hardener. Uh, it hardens in about uh, an hour, uh, it's, or actually significantly less, about about 30 minutes, and it's just meant to fill uh, pinholes and very, very small cracks. Uh, that would also work. Um, nothing structural, though. This is all just aesthetic uh, fixing. Uh, the next one being a two-part compound. Uh, this is a, uh, a fairing compound. What I get is total fair. Basically, you just mix the two uh, colors together, and you get a very easy to work with uh, fairing compound. Um, it f fills uh, pretty big gashes. Um, th there's kind of different purposes. This is uh, a little bit more uh, uh, harder than this. The only problem with using epoxy is that it's a lot harder to sand and smoothen out. 
uh, if you're trying to sand areas with thickened epoxy, uh, and then the other part of uh, other side of it is a, just a, a normal fiberglass part of the hole. Um, you're gonna have lows and high spots because the epoxy is a lot harder to sand. Um, so that's what's beneficial of using a fairing compound. Uh, between all these, that's pretty much all you need. The other last part of it is I'll go over the types of fiberglass. There's uh, random strands. Uh, this is just you peel it apart or, or cut it. This is kind of what you fill areas with. This is kind of the bulk, uh, what you bulk up areas with. This is what you primarily use. I like using S-cloth as the final touch um, for anything that I fiberglass. It just is a very lightweight, very, very strong um, layer that uh, kind of smooths everything out. The uh, epoxy fills in really well with this, and you don't get kind of random strand looking finishes. So uh, I like using S-cloth -cloth as the last Last layer. Uh, then there's biax. The biax is very uh, thick, very strong. This is what you're going to be primarily using for uh, the footholds, uh, the foothold trays, um, the sidewalls. Um, it's a little bit harder to bend around small corners, so you primarily want to use biax for uh, large, flat structural areas um, and that's pretty much all the different types of fiberglass and the items that you'll need all right uh, so I just finished cutting these these are just gonna slide right into place here and I'm gonna put two layers down um, so that'll kind of fill the back part of the hole that I'm going to be repairing. And uh, all subsequent layers, probably about three or four layers, I'm going to then uh, progressively uh, uh, fill in the, the um, kind of the gradient um, that, I, that I created here. So um, anyways, stay tuned. This is the point where you would add the cabasil if you're wanting to just thicken it up like peanut butter. But since we're doing uh, fiberglass, we need it to be very wet. Um, but yeah, you just want to stir this up really good. Uh, spend a lot of time mixing it because you do not want any uh, resin without any uh, hardener in it. You'll just have wet fiberglass for weeks and eventually you'll have to take it off which is a nightmare um, you want to basically just avoid that scenario altogether
strands can just be cut out and uh, doesn't have to be a perfect straight. It's all random strands anyways. So just lay it on. In fact, you don't even have to use scissors. You can just kind of pull it. So here's a picture of the uh, total fair compound. I lost my video uh, footage of me applying it, but it's very straightforward. Uh, you just mix the two parts together uh, to create this green, uh, dark green texture uh, color, and um, you're just going to be spreading it just like peanut butter across your uh, fiberglass repair and let it dry. And then you're just going to sand it completely flat so that it's flat with the uh, rest of the hole. Um, usually I do this process uh, two to three times till it's completely flat with the hole. So here's a picture of me using the total fairing compound across the remainder of the hole uh, to fill in all the cracks that I was mentioning before. Um, this was a bit extreme. I didn't need to do all of this. I used about a half of the tub, which surprisingly went a long ways. Um, but no, I would not do this because you're going to sand about 90% of that off anyways. So uh, just use the compound, um, you know, use your best judgment of where you need to apply it. But I definitely would not use it to the excess that I am showing in this picture. As I, I said, 90% of it is going to be sanded off anyways. So, so this is the uh, pinhole filler that I was mentioning earlier. Um, you're going to be spending a lot of time looking really closely um, and filling in all the pinholes. Uh, this step is best to be done after the primer. Uh, the primer really kind of highlights where those pinholes are, uh, but you can use it, you know, kind of uh, right after your fiberglassing and fairing compound, and then you can use it also after your primer, uh, and then you can just keep using it wherever you need it, and then uh, your last step would be your paint job. Um, once again, this material is not structural. Uh, in any way, shape, or form. It's just meant for pinholes and very, very light cracks. Uh, and, and to highlight on that cracks part, it will not stop the cracks from spreading. Um, that needs to be fixed prior to filling the crack. If you've uh, finished doing your footholds and you've uh, found that there's some unevenness in your uh, fiberglassing job, the fairing compound is great for kind of flattening out those areas and and leveling out the uh, tray area. Um, with that, I think we'll segue into uh, defoaming uh, and doing footholds. So I do have a lot to say and kind of critique on uh, uh, waterlogged skis. Uh, this is only from experience uh, for so far four jet skis in a row. Uh, all four jet skis have been waterlogged. Um, and this is kind of my experience with having a waterlogged ski. I was up at a, a resort uh, with my ski left in the water for the entire week. Um, beginning of the week, my ski was running great, uh, zipping across the water. And by the uh, end of the week, uh, the ski was almost unrideable um, in the sense that uh, it was bobbing up and down just just even at like 10, 20 miles per hour, I was just bobbing constantly. Uh, my brother noticed it, everybody noticed it, and I'm a, a you know a veteran rider, so I know how to shift my weight forward and everything like that. Uh, but the ski was definitely unrideable. Uh, I put it on the trailer, brought it home, and my I noticed there was uh, water dripping from the back of the ski. 
And at that point I knew my ski was, you know, weighed down so much that it was causing my ski to porpoise. Um, so, um, I decided to defoam my jet ski. Um, and, uh, it is a big process, uh, not for the faint of heart. Um, you have to basically, uh, grind out, uh, kind of a whole section off of the back, uh, of your, uh, tray. You have to go along the footholds, um, and avoid the pump area with your grinder and, um, don't go too far forward. Don't hit your exhaust pipe, uh, with the grinder. So there's a lot of things to look out for. Uh, that being said, I think everybody, you know, should do it. It's a, it's a good, if you're going to be doing a full restore on a jet ski, you 100% should defoam your ski. Um, you don't want to, you know, spend all this money on a nice paint job and a new engine, uh, only to just have that in the back of your mind that it's waterlogged. Um, so um, definitely do this, and uh, yeah. So let's get into how how to do that exactly. Uh, I did lose my video footage of, of this, so I'm going to be going off of pictures, um, which is unfortunate. So using this picture as a kind of a, a reference, um, you can kind of see where I made my cuts. Uh, as far as the sidewalls, uh, I like having a little bit of a lip for the fiberglass to uh, hold on to. Uh, so that's why it curves over. Uh, into the tray, and I left that little curve there um, on the, si the sidewall. Uh, same with the front part. I left a little bit of a lip uh, for the fiberglass to rest onto when I do my fiberglassing. So I made the cut um, uh, at that point there. Um, as far as the back, um, you could go a little bit further back but it, it makes it a little bit harder with the way the back of the ski bends so um, once again I, I find that where I made the cut there is also good uh, the part that's actually kind of hard to make cuts uh, is the center part um, you can actually I just left it in place so I, I am using that as a reference of how high my tray is gonna be um, of where I need to put the new uh, fiberglass, but you can also remove that center part. That's a lot harder because it's held down with uh, an epoxy. Um, so you'd have to really pry that off. Instead, I just chose to cut around it. You do want to cut as close as you can possible without hitting it, obviously, uh, because you need to get your uh, crowbar in there to scrape out all the foam. So definitely get as close as you can without cutting it. Uh, you can just, you know, pull it back bits and pieces at a time until it's as close as you feel comfortable. Um, but that's kind of the reference point. Um, and uh, as far as once it's all cut off and pulled out, um, you can just toss that fiberglass. And um, uh, what you're going to be doing is using a crowbar, a large uh flat uh, uh, screwdriver, uh, flathead screwdriver, and um, uh, the best tool is a multi-tool with a scraper attachment. It just kind of cuts into the foam, and then you can use a, a crowbar to pull it out into sections. Um, I, I just kind of thrust the, the crowbar in, pry it, thrust it in, pry it, thrust it in, pry it, uh, and then just, I use probably the crowbar 90% of the time. Um, and you do have to watch out for the, uh, water pipes. Uh, I like to replace those anyways. They're only a few bucks to replace for a nice stainless steel off Amazon, uh, which I'll get to. Uh, so if you do ding it with your crowbar, it's not a huge deal at all. In fact, I would even recommend replacing the water lines with a nice aluminum. So don't even worry about it. And we'll get to that later. So here's a couple pictures of when the ski is fully defoamed. Um, you don't have to get it this sparkling clean, but I would get it, uh, you know, completely cleaned up to where all the holes are and all the uh, tubes uh, where they meet the hole, uh, clean them down to, uh, to that at, at the bare minimum. And I'll go over of why you want to do that. 
All right, this is a video to make you all paranoid. I'm gonna show you how many holes there are in a super jet. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20. That one's a good one. So as you can see, those holes need to be sealed. Um, this is the point in time where you should replace the uh, water lines with new aluminum lines if they look like they've been dinged by your crowbar. Um, and you need to put... Uh, uh, 5200 marine sealant on everything just kind of go crazy I would use an entire tube which is like unfortunately like 30 bucks uh, but use a whole tube of marine 5200 on all the seals uh, just kind of scoop it up with your hand and and just rub it all the way around the uh, tubes um, and PVC pipes um, and just kind of go crazy this is also a good time to install the uh, Rad Dude's larger round nose exhaust pipe. Um, since you've got the tray open, uh, it just makes it that much easier. Um, in fact, you just pop it in and you can either screw in the back, whereas I chose to use rivets. Um, and then of course, you can also then apply 5200 to both sides so you can seal it right in. What I wish I would have done, uh, which I actually didn't, I'm going to be doing it on my next build, is to uh, put on the pump shoe at this point um, with the inside of the hole open and put bolts on the other side of it um, and then put 5200 over those bolts so that no water can, can enter through the pump shoe screw holes. Uh, one thing that I found out when installing the pump is the, the pump actually just has these self-tapping screws that are really small and they just puncture right into your your, your very very thin hole and, and uh, let water through. I, I think that it's, it's a, a huge engineering mistake and uh, I think everybody's ski is letting water in through the pump shoes screw holes. Um, so when you're installing pumps, either A, use a ton of 5200 uh, on the other side, um, but since you've got the hole open, I would just put bolts uh, to latch on the pump shoe and get a nice aluminum one so it'll never uh, break because um, it'll be pretty hard to replace if you uh, put bolts on the other side. But, but yeah, I would put bolts on the other side and, and put a glob of 5200 over that as well. So once you get everything uh, sealed, uh, the next step is to uh, do a leak test from inside the engine bay. Um, you want to fill your engine bay completely with water and then let it uh, see if it drips into your uh, hole. Um, and I would let it sit there for a, a couple of hours uh, to deem it uh, waterproof worthy. Uh, and then the next step is going to be starting to foam. So here's the fun part. Uh, you get to mix your uh, two-part uh, foam together and um, pour it in and then start shaping it. Um, you just want to make sure everything's sealed before you start doing this because uh, there's no turning back. I'm going to show an embarrassing photo real fast. Uh, yep, that's my creation. Um, it just kind of comes to show that you can pour in the foam however you want because uh, you're just going to be trimming it down and making it look nicer. So just get it in there as best you can and then use a multi-tool uh, scraper and it just cuts it clean um, and at that point you can then start glassing over it. I don't actually have any footage of me fiber glassing, which is unfortunate. I'll probably make a second video to go over some of the stuff I missed, but um, overall, you want to be cutting it to shapes, um, to shape around the foam job that you just did. And you're going to be putting, um, I would say, 
bare minimum of two layers of biax on the bottom. Um, I would probably do no more than four though. Uh, I, two is fine. Um, and then on top of the biax, you're going to be doing just some random strand uh, fiberglass. And then I would just uh, top it off uh, with the S cloth to kind of smooth out your fiberglass job. So e even if you do two layers of biax, you're still gonna have four layers in total, which to me is plenty. Uh, you may even get away with doing one layer of biax, but uh, I, I probably would uh, do two. Um, and you're gonna be using biax on the side walls as well. Um, the parts that you need to pay most attention to are the corners. You want to actually overlap the corners. Uh, so you'd uh, kind of take the flat part from the bottom of the tray and round it upwards to go up the sidewall. Um, and when you do those rounding of corners, you want to make sure there's no air pockets when you do. It's actually kind of hard to do round surfaces without getting air um, in, in between. So make sure you uh, look out for those air pockets. Um, spend a lot of time making it waterproof. You don't want any leaks. Um, and the final layer is going to be your total fare. Uh, just make use that as the last flattening efforts um, to, to kind of scoop over all of your, your uh, fiberglass uh, job. And at that point, just sand uh, quite a bit. You can just use 100 grit or 120 grit and just kind of sand it all down. And uh, at that point, you are ready to paint and uh, good to go. You don't have to worry about how good it looks because you're going to be covering it with turf. So it can look really terrible because um, the end product is all that you care about. You don't have to... Um, uh, Paint it with a, uh, a, a primer um, because you actually don't want there to be a primer because that'll actually lift up and peel uh, when you do your turf. So don't use any paints on this finished product as well. So the next step is to uh, sand everything and get it ready for paint. Um, so this is where you're going to be spending a huge amount of time um, so let me just go over a lot of tips I know it's just sanding um, but uh, there there definitely is uh, an art to sanding uh, so for the most part you're gonna be using a, uh, a random disk orbital orbital sander um, and you're going to be uh, keeping it flat you never want to angle your grinder uh, when people find out that you can angle the grind or the sander um, and it and it makes it sand things quicker, it, it becomes an addiction to always keeping your sander at an angle. Uh, the bad thing about that is is that it'll create uh, highs and low points in your uh, final paint job. So uh, resist temptation and keep your uh, orbital sander flat. Um, if you've got 500 hours of sanding under your belt, you will get to know when you should and should not angle your sander to kind of dig into an area that you need to sand. Uh, but for the most part, keep it flat. Um, second tip is to uh, not go around corners with the sander. Uh, you'll create flat parts along the, the rounded corners, which you do not want. Um, uh, so you're going to be going over all the rounded areas with your hand um, or a uh, uh, the best thing to get is one of those soft uh, sanding um, pads that kind of shape to to what you're sanding um, and that's pretty much it you can use uh, you can start out with uh, you know 120 grit to get all the really bad spots out uh, you can then switch to uh, 400 uh, as the the last uh, thing uh, that you need. You don't need to go anything higher than that because um, the primer will take care of that. So just have the 320 or 400 as your final 
uh, sanding efforts, but uh, definitely start with 120 uh, to get rid of the, the bulk of all the imperfections. Um, and then you're going to be using that uh, putty that I mentioned earlier to fill in all the little divots and all the imperfections. Uh, you can use the total fair to, to uh, get rid of low points. Uh, so you can just put a huge amount of total fair in an area and then sand it down uh, until that it's, the whole area is flat. Um, and uh, you're going to be going back and forth with fiberglassing and, and total fair until everything's just kind of... Uh, perfect the way you wanted it and then uh, yeah the next step is going to be primering and then painting and you'd be almost done at that point Shout outs to uh, Ryan Kamazi for letting me use his, uh, his shop to paint my ski. Uh, as good as this paint job came out, uh, he, his, his work is far superior than my own. So if you need any paint jobs or ski restorals, uh, definitely reach out to him. Hey guys, uh, so I did finally get my ski painted. Looks awesome. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and continue making this restoring video. Uh, I did kind of get too excited and started doing a few things uh, not on video, so let me point out some of the things that I did. Alright, so underneath the jet ski, there's this area right in here. The uh, whole pump system is removed, and what I did was I siliconed in uh, with uh, using 5200. Uh, I siliconed in a uh, pump stuffer. So um, while you've got everything off, they're really easy to install. Uh, what they do is uh, comparing it to a hole that does not have a pump stuffer, there's a, a big cavity area that water uh, can go into as it's getting uh, coming in through the jet ski. So what you're doing with a pump stuffer is is getting rid of most of that area uh, to uh, kind of better direct the flow of water. So um, as you can see it just shoots it right into your uh, pump. And the, the film they use is um, some type of water resistant coating so it just kind of glides on too. Uh, so try not to put any silicone on this area and kind of clean it the best you can. But yeah, that's all it is to install it is just uh, just kind of seal all of the edges with silicone and it's really easy. Uh, the second thing that I did was, uh, so this is an aluminum uh, much sturdier uh, shoe that you want to install. Um, really easy to do. All there is is four screw holes that takes it off and you kind of have to pry it off because it's going to be siliconed. Um, what I recommend doing, uh, which is a bit overkill, but I mean to be honest I would recommend doing it. Uh, I sealed silicone all around the edges of the entire shoe and then I put silicone over the screws themselves. So uh, what people don't realize is, is right on the other side of this screw is the, the hole. And it's just paper thin uh, wall, just fiberglass. Um, so if you don't put any type of silicone and you have your, gel uh, your jet ski sitting in uh, the water for a couple of days, um, it's going to fill in your entire hole and waterlog the foam. So I would, uh, especially if you've got the tray open, I'll just show you what it looks like. Uh, 
So here's basically the same holes. Um, this this one's actually this one's actually filled in. It should be down here. But yeah, you can put, you can if you've got this hole uh, open, you can put in epoxy over it. Um, I mean, what I would recommend doing is even putting a nut on the other side. Uh, so it's got something to uh, really secure down your shoe and then just pour epoxy over it so that there's just no way water can get in on the other side. Um, you can do the same thing with the um, water hoses and you can do the same stuff for any type of uh, trim line which would go here and then your turning line which will go there. Uh, just kind of pour epoxy over it, uh, just kind of get all those lines secured. So, um, yeah, anyways. So, I put epoxy around these cooling lines as well, or not epoxy, I put 5200 around these cooling lines as well. I also put 5200 around here. So this screws off, and I'm going to show you what it looks like. So, here's that part. So this is the part that screws off, and the turning cable feeds through there. Um, what you're going to want to do, if you have the hole open like the other one I was showing you, you can uh, epoxy the other end, because this is the only seal that's preventing a ton of water going into your, to your tray. So... Um, you could put 5200 on both sides. Uh, definitely recommend that. So that's for that part right there. Uh, other than that, that's the bottom of the hole. I'm going to be reattaching my scoop grate, which is just four bolts. Goes right here and over there. Uh, the other thing I'll be doing is putting the, the pump back in, which just attaches right here. And here, and same on the other side. And then you want to hook up your two, two cooling lines. Um, and I'll show you how to convert your existing bilge line into just a second, uh, a second um, cooling line. Uh, so I'll go over that later. All right, so I'm gonna quickly go over the uh, pump assembly. Um, once again, these are the four bolts that I was mentioning earlier, that's how you remove it. And the pump just slides out. You might have to kind of tug on it, uh, but because some people put silicone here and it kind of snugs it in, uh, just pull hard and it'll come loose. Um, this is the second cooling line that I added. So normally this, this little outlet is just uh, sealed and you have, to, you have to tap into this to add a, a right angle uh, uh, barb for your your extra your second cooling line um, The other side is is right here. This is stock So now you've got one on each side um, The nice thing about it is this will feed right into the stock bilge uh, line and you just remove the stock bilge line and you add a, a uh, an aftermarket one like um, Which I'll show you later as well. So um, you don't really need the stock bilge if you add a second bilge. Um, so, and it just makes it a lot easier to add two cooling lines. So yeah, you do have to tap it. And, um, that's pretty much it for that. Uh, this is the, what the bilge line previously hooked into, and I just capped it with a rubber cap and a zip tie. Um, uh, other than that, just make sure your uh, blades are clean. This is a brand new impeller, uh, but what you can do is if, if you've got any chips, you can kind of sand it down. There is a specific angle you have to uh, file it down on, so I would kind of research that uh, or send it to somebody like Impeller Pros, uh, but you don't want any chips on here, and you want the sidewalls to be very clean. Um, second thing, is a pump this is a or sorry a, a cone this is a an aftermarket one that i added from blosion there's just different tips you can add um, and those are easy to install as well 
So here's the other side uh, of the uh, uh, pump area that I was talking about. So this is the stock uh, bilge line that I've just converted into a second water line. It's just painfully easy. Um, just remove it and and just feed this into your uh, intake manifold. Um, or excuse me, uh, <laughs> not your intake, your exhaust manifold. Um, and that's pretty much it. Um, and that'll give you a second cooling line. And just to kind of recap, those stick into here and here, which go here and here. So I've got the pump set two cooling lines are plugged in turning cables plugged in and uh, I'm not going to tighten these back bolts yet because I need shims so if you look at this well, I don't know if you can see it. It's too far down, so I need to lift it up so that it's centered. And to do that, you just put shims, you put shims under these rear bolts. If you don't have this, uh, this shaft centered, when you put your mid shaft on, it's gonna be pushing down on this housing here, which will cause unnecessary heat. And if it's pushing really hard down, a lot of people burn through their mid shafts. So make sure that's centered first with shimming it from the back, and then put this on and make sure it's centered with your engine, and that's when you use shims on your engine mounts so that it lines up with the mid shaft. So these are the shims that I bought. You can get a package of them. And I just shimmed it up two of the larger ones on the back. So now it fits perfectly centered. And this will slide right on there. Be real nice. All right, I've got the uh, intake grade and the ride plate hooked in. Uh, really straightforward. There's just four bolts there. And four bolts there. So, pretty straightforward. So I use something called Total Bilge. Uh, there's a few other brands out there. This one actually worked great. Um, I think it was even the cheaper of the choices. Um, what it does is it gives your uh, engine compartment a nice uh, coating, which makes it really slippery for grease, so it cleans up really easily. Uh, it also uh, went over 5200. This is 5200 right here, and it it is bonding to that really well and it's not flaking um, and it seals everything so there's not going to be any pinholes that'll let uh, water into your uh, tray area so um, definitely cleans up your engine bay and I, I highly recommend doing it uh, all I did was brush it on uh, so I bought a roller uh, and a brush um, it actually dried within an hour so um, that is a bilge coat. All right, it's time to install the um, hood seal. Uh, what I'm gonna do is kind of clean up the edges with some acetone. Uh, for anything you wanna do with adhesive, you always wanna prep the surface first. Bunch of dirt I didn't even see. 
And what I like to do is put the end pieces towards the front because the back side is going to see water first. So you want the uh, these two pieces to merge on the front where water is less likely to come into your hole. Just a quick tip when doing the uh, hood, hood seals. So if you have a square nose, um, for some reason the hood, uh, instead of being in the middle, it actually is like right here. So uh, tuck the uh, hood seal on the front um, as close to this sidewall as possible, or else it won't um, make uh, touch with the, with the, the hood. Um, I had this back uh, this way more, and it wasn't even touching the seal. So as you can see, the line is just right on the edge, the, the, the print imprint of the hood seal. Um, so that, that's the imprint right there. So don't put your seal back this way. So what I did next was uh, just put these little brackets in. These middle ones are meant for the uh, water box which goes behind. And these ones are meant for the uh, gas tank. This one connects to a piece that goes on the um, battery holder. So that's why there's not one right here. So it'll connect to this one. Uh, the other thing I did was uh, put in the engine mounts, just uh, two bolts on each. So this is where it gets a bit different. Uh, so this is a round nose conversion bracket for a square nose. Uh, the big difference is when you put them next to each other, it's significantly uh, wider. So the, the conversion makes it kind of sucked in a lot more and uh, allows for different aftermarket pulls. Um, you can use this, but you have to put a ton of spacers in the middle so that the uh, steering system doesn't kind of uh, slop around. So most people just end up swapping out for a conversion bracket. You can use a round nose, but you're going to have to tap new... Uh, holes that go down into your hole so you'd have to tap new new bolt holes um, but they're the same size on the inside so they'll fit aftermarket brackets or aftermarket poles as well so anyways uh, how you attach them is just two bolts on each side and there's a plate that goes underneath that secures it all right, on to the next phase. So I'm gonna put down a turf pad on the bottom here so that it'll uh, protect the uh, gas tank from kind of rubbing and bouncing. And um, I did the same for the uh, water box. Uh, so this water box fits right up against those uh, braces here and it'll protect the water box with padding in the front here. Uh, I really love this Jet Maniac water box. Um, it actually is kind of contoured to shape to the shape of the uh, super jet, so it just fits perfectly back there and won't bounce up and up and down. Um, one thing that I did was I used the stock pads and cut them a little bit uh, to add a little bit more protect protection there. So um, yeah, coming along.
All right, so usually there's a uh, hole here. Uh, this is the back of the ski. Usually there's a hole here that you can feed through uh, tie downs, but it goes across your turf and it doesn't look nice. Plus it uh, um, uh, kind of hurts your legs a little bit. So what I do is uh, add a bolt style. and fill in the previous hole and this works out a lot better and then all I've got to do is grind that flush and then I'm going to put padding over it. Another nice thing about having this bolt here, the tie downs come in this direction so they don't rub on anything and a lot of people install them here but if you have a bolt here that drills into your hole and that's going to cause a potential of water leaks because um, the more it bounces up and down it's going to get it loose and water is going to seep behind and you're going to have a waterlogged ski so this is just an awesome place for it and it's completely out of the way so the rear sponsons are pretty straightforward um, you can use the existing holes that attach to your bumper um, the back, the, the most rear one is actually a perfect starting one. I actually had to drill two new holes for the middle and uh, the middle and front, but uh, they're really straightforward. You just put the bolt through and attach them to the uh, the the rear or the the side bumper. So, anyway, it's not much more to say on that. So I've added a bumper which replaces the stock bumper. Um, this is essentially the material uh, that's used. It has an adhesive on the back and it just applies nicely to the entire hole. I've done it on both my jet skis. I like this stuff a lot. Uh, the nice thing is, is uh, it can take a beating. If you put turf on the bumper, it gets torn up after a season and you, you have to replace them and it's a nightmare to to take the turf off uh, so these bumpers I think they're they might be 50 60 70 bucks I'm not sure uh, you can get them at Watcon uh, or Blosion uh, maybe some other vendors as well um, I use this stock retaining bumper and normally they have a metal plate here so if you don't have that metal plate you can use a, a, wa a flat washer and a, a bolt system that actually goes into your uh, rear sponson as well. Uh, and then I'd also add some silicone on here so when water enters it just kind of brushes to the side. So definitely silicone this area here. Um, and you're left with a little bit of slack too so the rolls are definitely give enough, definitely give enough to use. And it just tucks behind these bumpers as well. Um, but I use it on both my skis. So I've got the cables ran, the handle pull hooked up. Uh, I've got the cables just kind of laying down here. So you're gonna have three. You're gonna have the throttle cable, the start start uh, start stop switch, and the um, turn cable which feeds to the back of the jet ski. So just those three cables. Uh, the rest, I've got this mounted, uh, engine mounts, water box ready, and the uh, gas tank pad set. What I'm gonna do next is drill in to the sides and put in a, um, a front sponson. I've already got the rear sponson set, but the reason why you wanna do the front sponsons First is because you're going to be drilling in to the hole and you don't want to be hitting any exhaust uh, uh, pipes with your drill which I've done and I had to replace them so uh, definitely do the front sponsons first get them bolted in uh, get them siliconed in and then once all of this is set you're ready to drop in your engine for the square nose front hood, basically you just slide these in here and you screw them in here. That gives you access to the uh, uh, 
bolt system, pull system there. So uh, this is an aftermarket cover. Normally there's a gas lid here, uh, so that's been removed on this one. So we need to install this uh, gas tank hose. So just connects right up into here and you use a, a tightener and it comes down here and that's where the gas tank sits, right here. It's a little bit windy. Uh, I'm just gonna show you what I did next. So you can get this uh, kit at Blosion. Basically, it's just a spot for your primer and uh, build switch. So both of those go in there and it recesses nicely on your dash. Um, I actually covered up the stock area so that's kind of what it looks like. There's um, a um, fuel selector that used to go here so if you did want to keep your fuel selector you would want to put this on the left side like that but uh, a lot of people just get rid of the fuel selector and just always run uh, their, 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 their longest fuel selection. So, um, anyways, that's the last thing I did. So I hate to say it, but you guys probably should watch a different video for installing tubbies. Um, I'm terrible. The, uh, video that, uh, uh, Pro Watercraft has, uh, to install their tubbies, um, is a lot better but basically I would recommend using tape um, that you can peel off so that your seams are are correct and from what I've noticed I've read a lot of forums you should be putting the uh, spons in as far forward as possible and the rear as high up as you can you want a very small lip here you don't want it flush if you have a little small lip in this area, it's just uh, a lot better to grab. Um, for the uh, Superjet, the, a lot of pros that do buoy races say to do anywhere from 35 and a half to 36 inches forward to the very tip from the very rear. Uh, other than that, one tip that I do is I would recommend getting a bolt and a nut system and a washer. That way they're really snug and you'll never, you know, it'll never come off. Um, I, I just would grind the, the excess off so it's more flush like that. Um, but that's pretty much it. This is kind of the standard area for doing a uh, bilge uh, outlet. So from the other side, uh, you basically want it just as far back as possible, uh, but enough to have some room for you to kind of crank it and remove the screws uh, in case you ever need to remove it. So don't put it at the very far back so that it's annoying. Um, also, you don't want to do it too far forward because it gets in the way of your exhaust. And you don't want to do it too far forward because you'd have to route the hose all the way back to the bilge because you want the bilge sitting in the back. You don't want it on this side because it's going to be in the way of your uh, exhaust outlet. Uh, so really the best place is right there. So the bilge install is pretty easy. I bought a bracket. Uh, there's a lot of... Um, companies out there that make these brackets for these bilges. Um, just hit anybody up. I think probably High Speed Industries or Blosion or something. But there's a, a mount for your bilge. I would recommend them because it keeps it right where it needs to be. Um, and basically what you want to do is hook a, a hose and it goes out the side of your jet ski. And what you want to do is have a little trap. So I'm going to have uh, some zip ties to kind of bring it down and make a a loop here um, and that's pretty much it the uh, cable goes to your battery There's a, a, a power and ground and it feeds up to a switch 
turns it on and off. And then it, the cables go from that switch down to your bilge. And that is uh, essentially it. So I've got the engine just kind of placed in. Uh, as you can see, it's not bolted in. But that's where you do bolt it in. Um, just take your time. Uh, one thing you want to do is make sure that these are lined up. So just keep kind of spin it and make sure there's equal distance uh, on this side and this side. And th there's no tension on the bottom versus the top. So it has to be perfectly aligned. That way your um, drive shaft does not get hot. Um, so I mounted the uh, electronic box here. There's basically just uh, four uh, bolts that go on each side. They mount to a bracket. And um, I'll kind of show you what all the cables go to. So we'll just start with these two on the right. They go to your spark plugs. And the top one goes to your starter, which was right in there goes right to your starter. The middle one goes over to your battery. And this cable goes to your ground. And you've got your two cables on the side that go to your up, up your handle pull up to your starter. Um, so that's those two cables there. You've got a black and white and a red and brown one. The uh, final cable, which is this bottom one here, that goes into your e-box, uh, goes over to the engine right here. Um, and that's it. So that's the electronics and dropping in your engine. Uh, the next two things you're going to be doing, well, several things. Uh, I've got hook in the fuel lines, so I'll go over that next. Um, you're going to do the throttle cable system here. So you've got to hook that up to your handle, handle pull, which is this blue cable here. This goes up your handle pull. And it goes over to here. Uh, this is a uh, kind of a different setup, so normally your throttle cable will go right here. So this is a, a 760 uh, bracket because uh, I'm running dual uh, carbs, uh, dual 44 carbs uh, with a 760 manifold and so forth. Um, and once that's all good together, I'll be putting together my B-pipe, which hooks into here. And I'm going to have a tube going from here to here. And lastly, the uh, uh, fuel tank will hook into here and get placed right here. And you'll hook your fuel lines up to the carb and to your primer if you're going to be running a primer. Um, and then of course your fuel lines, uh, your, your cooling lines will go to from your head to the um, B pipe in, in a couple different configurations you can do. Um, but other than that, let me just show you one more thing. So down there is a cooling line coming from the pump and down there is a cooling line coming from the pump and they're going to hook into the manifold at both of those two locations there and there on the manifold so you know it's more nerve-wracking than putting on uh, decals is uh, videotaping it as if I was a pro and not messing up. Um, what I like to do is kind of get the surface wet. I use a RapidTech solution 
and you want to get your fingers a little wet. Peel the sticker off. Or sticker a little wet and place it on as best you can. Don't mess up like that. I'll bring it a little bit further back. It's going to be a little sticky because I'm pulling it off. That's pretty good. To get it to where you're happy with. Spray a little on there. And you want to be just very light. So we've got some creases going on here. I'm trying to figure out why it's doing that. So I'm going to work elsewhere first. Got some bubbles there. And I'm going to try to get rid of these creases, so I'm going to peel it back up. From a different angle so the creases go in this way so I'm going to peel this part back up That's pretty much it. Uh, now I'm just going to be working the water out, but there is a little bubble there actually. I was going to say there was no bubbles. So you want to be just really kind of light and you can kind of work the bubble out. So let's see if you can see the bubble. You don't want to be forceful. If it's not going, it's not going to go. Sometimes you have to go slow and let it move up, but you don't want to ever crease it. So see, I'm just going really slow. And the bubble's just slowly moving up. If I push on the bubble, you're just going to have this crease and it's going to look really gross. But that is a perfect decal. All right, so what I'm doing right now is uh, I'm putting an under layer where the foot holds go. Uh, the reason being is because when you pull up on your feet, your toes, uh, it really hurts if it's just hard. So I'm using um, decent sized thickness padding to slip underneath and you basically just cut it to size and slip it in there and use some contact cement to, to put it in place and what I'm going to do is uh, take a grinder or a sander 
and kind of uh, shape it to the to this side a little bit. Um, then what's next is uh, I'm gonna start turfing, turfing the whole thing. All right, so the uh, grinder worked out really well. Um, you just have to have a, a good grip on it so it doesn't slide out. The foam's really easy to cut. Um, but you just want to kind of shape it to form so that the turf just kind of rolls over. Uh, but yeah, the grinder worked out pretty good. I just kind of uh, held it and kind of went like that. Um, so the next step is going to be the tray, which is this padding here. I used 18 millimeter for the footholds, and I'm going to use a little bit thicker to lay down in the tray. So my goal is to put the foam up right against here so that it's even with this. That way I can lay t uh, turf over the top of it and I get that much more tray room. A lot of people don't know what to do with this and you stub your toes on it. But if you get thick enough padding that makes it even with this, then you can put your your uh, matting flush onto this. Plus it gives it something nice to hold on to um, instead of uh, the thick padding. So it holds on and lasts for a lot longer and it won't peel up because you're actually sticking your turf to this part. So everything's working out. Stay tuned. All right, so I'm gonna make a quick video on turfing. Um, I'm probably gonna do a whole separate video just with turfing alone. Uh, it's definitely um, an acquired skill set. Um, you probably might even go through two rolls your first time doing it just due to mistakes. So, um, in fact, everybody does it a little bit differently, but uh, I'm going to go over some tips real fast on what to do. Um, one of the tips is uh, apply the contact cement to both sides and just let it bake. Um, so contact the way contact cement works is, uh, this has been about 30 minutes, um, and that's the least amount I would wait. Uh, it's actually in the hot sun as well. Um, so wait about 30 minutes. You're not going to even feel any type of glueness to it. But um, just give me an example. This has a little bit of contact cement on it. When those two touch, it bonds, and it's impossible to get off like <laughs> I barely put those two together and it bonds really tough you could actually leave this sitting outside for all day and then touch these two sides together and it'll be a permanent bond some people um, wait don't wait on enough and they put it down when it's wet and gooey and you don't want any gooiness it's better to be um, multiple hours of drying before you bond the two together. Uh, second tip, uh, do the bottom tray last. Uh, the reason being is because when you do, uh, padding and turf, it raises it up a little bit, which hides all of your lower seams. So do all of the sidewalls first, that way they go way down below, and the bottom tray will cover up all those seams. Um, secondly, this is the trouble area right here when you try to bend this down. So I use the straight technique so the line is completely straight, but what happens is you get a big crease here, a big bubble, you have to kind of push it down or, or cut a line through it right here. Um, alternatively, you can bend it this way and have these lines here go this way, which get ri gets rid of this fold here. Um, and then you, but you do have to kind of trim this up accordingly. I think I like that technique better. I don't like having this little cut here. Uh, it looks better when this is just kind of shifted at this angle. 
and there's no cut there. There. Uh, secondly, I would try to retain the stock bumper. Um, it folds up and uh, covers up the rear quite nicely so it doesn't peel up underneath. Um, as you can see, the bolt that I have is now hidden with two inches of um, padding. So you can't feel that bolt at all. Um, some more tips. So in the front of the square nose, I put a two inch padding uh, just so when your feet hits it, you've got some cushion there. So I kind of shaped the edge a little bit further down. That way I've got some padding in the front here. Um, other than that, I'll just take a, have you take a look at all my seams, just so you can kind of get an idea of what yours might look like. Um, kind of a weird tip. Um, when I'm cutting this area, I like to leave kind of this area a little bit bigger and then push it in and kind of push into the corners and uh, let it sit there for like 10 minutes and then when you pull it out it kind of leaves a, a, a tracing line for you to cut. So just cut it along the, the bend lines, put it back in there and see how, see how well it shapes and just kind of keep trimming it. Um, other than that, just take your time, and, uh, yeah, just take your time. Okay, uh, next on the list, I made a, uh, pull stopper, and I'll kind of just show you what I did. I took, uh, three, three pads, um, that I used for the, uh, bottom tray. I just t stuck three pads and uh, glued them together. And then I just took a grinder. Um, you could use some type of saw or anything to cut them to shape. Some people do squares. Uh, I chose to do circles this time. Normally I do squares. The uh, thing I didn't like about doing squares is uh, when going around the corners with turf, I uh, usually had to round off the corners. Uh, so I just figured it'd be much easier just to make a circle and it'd be a, a lot easier to just apply the turf all the way around. You want the backside to have the seam line and you want something on the top as well. Uh, what I did once it was all glued together is um, I took a grinder and it's actually really easy. You just take like a 90 degree grinder and grind the edges and it just kind of makes it a little bit more smooth looking around the edges. So yeah, just kind of grind and feather out the corners. Um, other than that, that's going to be glued right here. I made little um, imprints so that they would fit right into the um, the bolt holes. And I'm going to take some contact cement and just stick it down here, put some pressure on it, and it shouldn't go anywhere. Uh, the only time it's going to be use as if something's pushing down on it anyways, so it, it should hold pretty pretty easily. Uh, alternatively, you can make some type of contraption that sits on the bottom. Maybe you could uh, fiberglass something that sticks into the bolt holes and then put nuts on the other side. Uh, what this is for, on the other side there is the fire extinguisher holder, so you can choose not to use the fire extinguisher holder and build other, some type of contraption to hold this. Okay, just a quick video on installing uh, pissers. Um, basically, this is where your water lines uh, are going to feed into your exhaust system and then come out to, um, to two pissers. Uh, you may only need one pisser, just depends on your setup. So, um, what I did was use a uh, 9 sixteenths um, could probably use a little bit smaller. Um, might move around just a little bit, uh, but basically you just feed those through and you put a nut on the other side of it. Uh, wouldn't hurt to add some silicone in there as well. 
and uh, this is what it looks like on the other end. I tried to put it in this uh, section here, but you could do them over here. I would try to avoid not going this way, uh, just because it interferes with some parts, so that's a pretty good spot right there. Alright, uh, time to hook up the uh, exhaust tube. I bought a, uh, I think they call it a Black Mamba exhaust tube from uh, Rad Dudes. It's the larger exhaust pipe that fits the larger water box, that fits the larger, uh, this is also from Rad Dudes, this is the larger exhaust uh, pipe that goes through hole. Um, so, you kind of have to buy all three of them together do them all three at once on your build. Um, but basically it's the equivalent of the round nose. So if you already have a round nose, you're good to go. If you have a square nose, you could think about upgrading those three things. So other than that, you just hook up this here and hook up that end there. Uh, just a little cable management tip uh, to keep it looking very clean. Um, you can buy these things. These just stick in the corners along the rim, and you can hide all of your cables um, really easily. Uh, basically, you just slip a, a zip tie through these holes, and the other side six sticks to the end. You can use super glue or just use the sticky. I haven't had any of them peel off, and I've used the, the adhesive that came with it, so... Uh, yep. So one thing I noticed when installing the B-pipe is um, the little uh, bolt system I used for my tubbies is uh, rubbing against my B-pipe. So I made a little square foam pad with a kind of a center cutout on it. And I'm going to put it right on top of those. And it'll allow the B-pipe to squish up against it. And it won't uh, damage the B-pipe. And I'm going to just put contact cement on it. Stick them right on. I think these are the only two that you really need. And there's one more back there. So there's three in total that you need to cover. Alright, uh, so I just installed the B-pipe. I'm going to go over some quick tips and how you should be doing it. Uh, supposedly you can do it with the gas tank and water box installed. Um, I personally found it was impossible, but uh, you never know. Um, what I found to be easiest was to put the head pipe in place and uh, secure this one first, but leave this one loose, and um, leave these three bolts out so this can kind of slide around, and just kind of put it here, and then from this side of the jet ski you should stand, and just kind of put your arm down here, and then push by holding the stinger and push it into place and then tighten this down. Um, tighten this down while you're pushing down on the head pipe and while you're pushing in from the stinger. So have two people do it with you. Have somebody uh, holding the head pipe and pull, pushing in on the stinger and then have the other person tighten the screw. You want to be pushing down on this and pushing on the stinger so that this is in a perfect position and that this, uh, these two pieces are touching metal inside here and so that the rings get placed in a perfect position. Um, other than that, the other tip I did was I put pads on the other side so that it doesn't rub against the back wall and then I put one big pad down here so that it doesn't rub on the uh, flywheel cover and it just really puts this in a in a comfy position and doesn't rattle around and your all your pieces are protected um, but yeah then past that then just bolt these down once this is secure bolt these down make sure to put your gasket in here and then you're just going to be hooking up the water lines which are right here and you're going to hook it into here. Uh, this one will go out to the pisser and this one will route to your 
stinger. Uh, with a flow control valve and with a T that goes out the one of these pissers here. So next I'm going to be doing the water box and hook it into the pipe and then putting in the gas tank and should be almost done. Okay, this is how I did the water routing. So there's two outlets. Uh, the first one goes down to the bottom of the head pipe, right down there. It then comes out the top here and goes into a T, a brass T. So this one goes out the pisser and this T goes into a flow control valve which connects into the stinger of the B pipe. So there's that T, flow control valve, stinger. Uh, this one just uh, goes from straight from the head to the pisser. Alright, I'm getting really antsy because I'm pretty much almost done. So I'll go over this quickly. Um, Gas tank was really hard to sn snug in there. Uh, I don't actually remember how I shifted it, but um, you want to put this end in first. It's going to like push really hard up against this. You just want to jam it in there. You definitely need the uh, exhaust hose plugged in prior, and you need the uh, electric uh, the um, battery holder removed. And you just want to kind of jam it in there. Uh, one thing I definitely would recommend doing is putting a pad in here for that corner. Um, best way to do it is to pull on it this way and have somebody else push on it this way. And then uh, get some Dawn dish soap and just spray it on both sides. And then spray it on a, a piece of foam. Uh, Dawn dish soap on a piece of foam. And then just kind of jam it in there and just kind of jam it in that way. Uh, eventually the soap will wa wash off and it'll be uh, impossible to remove. So definitely put something there. Um, with all these pieces of foam that I was showing in the video, this B-pipe is really snug. Um, it's going to help with uh, not rattling. So um, next... Next and last step is going to be battery and fuel lines. Okay, she is done. 100% done. Uh, last thing I did was fuel tank. And for my particular setup, I'm running a pump on each carb. So I have a fuel line. Uh, going from the main fuel line and also the reserve. I turned the reserve into a main fuel line as well, so I've got one hooked up to each carb. Um, this is what I did for a one-way valve on my uh, uh, fuel tank vent. I've got the return line teed here, um, going to the fuel line here, or the return line here. I've got my primers hooked up. They're teed off as well here. And that's about it. All right, guys, that concludes the video. I uh, hope you learned a lot. Um, in a few seconds, I'm going to show it running. Uh, but if you have any questions, if I didn't cover anything fully, uh, leave me a, a comment. I'll read pretty much all of them. Um, and I'll have a, a second video coming out soon. It's going to be over the round nose. Uh, so as you can see, it needs a lot of work. And yeah, anyways, uh, peace out. I'll leave you a video with it running.